we thank you for this time that you've given us together. Thank you, God, for all that we've heard and all that's been saying and done and read. Father, we love you and we bless you, Lord. Take this time that you've allotted us tonight, if you tarry, this week, Lord, and do great things in hearts and lives. Remind people that you're still God. Bring them home. Bring them in. Father, we will bless you. We will thank you. And we will give you all the praise in the mighty name of Jesus. And let everybody say amen. amen. Before you're seated, let's read Ecclesiastes 11, verses 1 to 5. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, and the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. I want to read verse 4 again. It's where I'm preaching at. He that observes the wind shall not sow, and he that regards the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Father, bless the word I preach in the name of Jesus and let everybody say amen and amen. Let's go ahead and thank him for his goodness, his grace and mercy over our lives. Hallelujah. I'm preaching for a few moments on watching the wind. There's a specific verse I read a couple of times because I bring this reality that verse number four is exactly built around multiple verses, but verse number four is where I really want to spend some quality time just preaching on that. Building up to that, you have Ecclesiastes, and you, you have a lot of verses. You have chapters that talk about seasons and reasons why to the seasons, a time to, a time to, a time to build, a time to plant, time to pluck up that which is planted. There's just a time to everything. I love Ecclesiastes. There's little morsels spread throughout it, and in chapter number 11, it's no different. It gives significance when you really break down what is the Word of God speaking to us about today? How is this relatable in 2024? It is extremely relatable. The Bible, first of all, starts out in verse number one talking about cast your bread upon the water. This is tied into, you've got to get the bigger picture as opposed to it makes no sense to take bread and throw it on the water without a reason or a cause. But it does when you consider that it lines up with the law of sowing and reaping. So as this is tied into the law of sowing, it can make no sense just simply to cast bread in the water. However, doing that means that you know with anticipation that it will come back. That as the Bible says in verse number one, for thou shalt find it after many days. So there is a law in the word of God that whatever you give him, that whatever you throw at him, whatever is handed to him from your hand extended, it will come back. It will return after many days. As you give today, not just financially, but of your time, which is as valuable because you cannot buy it back. Money can be spent. Time can be spent. You can get money back, but you cannot get time back. That's how valuable it is. You cannot buy it. You cannot stop it. You cannot run it, you cannot move it. It is time and it continues to tick by. But here in the word of God, there is a promise that whatever we cast into the water is going to return to us after many days. It is a picture. As the word of God describes, whatever you give, it is going to come back to you. Now that can be for the good and that can also be you reap what you sow. Which means... From your character, to your attitude, to your mindset, to, re, to your reactions, to the way that you treat people, 
things are going to come back to you. Praise God. The Bible then goes on to say in verse number two, talks about giving to people. In fact, the Bible really is trying to speak to us to say giving to several people because you never know that there will be a day when you're going to have a need. We all have to understand that this isn't about us. All of us need to understand in the body of Christ, we are a component of the body of Christ. We're not one in totality all by ourselves like an island out here. We are connected to the body of Christ. So we have to understand that there are gonna be days when you have this ability to give. You have the resources to pull from. Whether you give someone a word, you give someone a bit of your time, you give someone good counsel, which in the number of good counsels and counselors, the Bible says there's safety. When I make decisions, I, I, I don't make financial decisions very often at all. It is very minimal without the help and the aid of the board of this church. I do that because there's safety in numbers and there's safety in counsel and there's safety in people that pray and there's safety in people that have walked where I'm walking right now and they provide good counsel. But the fact is, saints of God, out of your resources, out of your personal abundance, when you give to people, it will come back to you. This is giving knowing that if I have it, I want to be resourceful and give it. Because there's going to be times, Ecclesiastes states that, there may, there may be a time, there may be an opportunity for someone else to help you along the way. And most likely, the people in your sphere of influence or your community or relationships are going to be the very ones that know what no one else knows that can jump in and help you out. So always be willing to pray for somebody. Always be willing to stop and encourage somebody. Always be willing to be a conduit that's not like a sponge, but that is willing to take what we have and to bless other people and to encourage them. Always stop along the way to help pick somebody up instead of just walking by them in their demise. Be willing to go out of your way to comfort somebody else. Be willing to make the phone call when it crosses your mind and you answer back with, somebody else will do it. You be the one that steps up and goes out of your way to encourage somebody that you never know when they're suffering are battling, are going through the trial of their life because they may look good and they may look Christianese as the language is. They may look like they're on top of the mountain, but you never know the struggle internally that is going on. You never know when you're going through a struggle and you wish somebody would speak a word to you of encouragement and strength to you. You never know when you feel like you're weebling and wobbling and about to fall down and somebody needs to approach you and tell you about the goodness of God and to hang in there. Man, I've had some trials in my life that I'm thankful that obedient Christians came into my territory, walked into my comfort zone and said, hey, you better hold on because the best is yet to come. I was standing yesterday outside here come a precious little lady walking behind beside and then all of a sudden I shook her hand, she shook my hand. She looked at me, she said, oh brother pastor. She said, the Lord is using you greatly. He is doing great things in your life. I was just trying to ask her how she was doing and it just started rolling up out of her and she looked at me and before she walked away, she looked at me and she said, the best is yet to come. Hallelujah. Let go of my hand and just kept on on walking you never know sometimes when it's you being obedient and out of the resources that God gave you I mean come on saints how many more scripture do you need before you share it with somebody how much more joy do you need before you give some of that to somebody else how much more happiness do you need before you have to stop and spread some happiness how much more health do you need that you can't stop and pray for somebody and minister to them that might be struggling in their health 
I'm just telling you when you cast your bread upon the water, it's going to come back after many days. It might not come back today. It might not be tomorrow, but God is always going to take care of you. I can look at people in this church that drove here living in their car and now they've got homes and now they've got jobs and now they've got responsibility and now God has been good to them. Why? Because we poured the gospel into them and we encouraged them and we loved on them and we told them it's going to get better. It cannot get any worse. You're living you're walking, you're talking, you're breathing, you're eating, you're functioning. It's going to be all right if you've got enough faith in the inside of you to believe that God is able. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do not look around and say, well, it looks like they've got everything they need. It's quite the contrary. We're doing everything we can. So that means we need everything we can. <laughs> Hallelujah. Get where God blesses us and helps us. He is an amazing God. But to do what we do, we can't live on the budget of yesteryear. We are dependent on God's people. We are thankful for every door that God has opened and every window from heaven that God has opened. But we have gotten to the place in our life where we just depend on God's going to meet the needs. I can't do this by myself. I know that God is able to meet the needs, but it's going to take people that believe in tithing and offerings and giving and saying, God, we know you're able. And it's not just to bless the church. You are the church. So as you bless the church, you... <laughs> this is getting laborious. But I'm going to keep on preaching. <laughs> High five your neighbor, shout, set him on fire, Jesus. <laughs> when we give, we know that there's going to be a day that we have a need and the question is how hospitable have we been? How accommodating have we been to God's people? God loves the poor. God loves the suffering. I can promise you that right now. He loves them. He wants to feed them. He wants to encourage them. He wants to strengthen them. He's going to do that by using us. I've walked into territories in my life and I've said, wow, this is a problem. And I've heard God answer me and say, you fix it. We pass out school supplies to pass out Christmas gifts at Christmas time and go into areas where unfortunate circumstances have happened for people. Praise God. We go into those territories and we want to bless them and help them. But I have found out life is more than just a Christmas toy. Sometimes they need a t-shirt, a tank top, or a sweater, or a coat. Praise God. And instead of walking away and going, wow, there's a need, and God says to me, you fix it. And so that's what we're going to try to do. For me, it may not ever be a coat. And I pray his blessings over my life, and I say that humbly and respectfully. But you never know what else it might be that I really, really need something from God, and his answer comes because we've been willing to give and cast it on the water. Again, it makes no sense to take bread and cast it on the water, but I think we get it, that this whole law of tithing or sowing, that reaping is going to come because it's like the seed and the seed is the word of God. But the reference here is giving, hallelujah. Uncertainty means that there's gonna be many uncertainties in our life. As much as there may be, there may be certainties as well. For every uncertainty you look at, God has a promise. For every battle you foresee, God's got a victory. For every time you're in despair, God knows how to bring deliverance. For every time you don't know how, he's already made a way before you ever showed up. For every time you are unknown, uncertain about things that might happen in your life, God is all-knowing and he's got everything worked out. His timing is impeccable. But this is where I want to preach. It's when you watch the wind. Because if you watch the wind, the direction of the weather, you will never proceed past the fear of failure if you watch what goes on externally. I say that because verse 
Number four says, he that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. So in other words, if you're waiting to do something and everything be perfect around you, perfection probably will never show up. There's always gonna be a forecast of something happening. There's always going to be a forecast of the potential for rain that would keep you from doing what you need to do to sow into the land. I remember when God on Brown School Road put it upon our heart to start buying houses next door to the building. And I looked around and I thought, well, is this the right time to do it? And I looked back over my life and I thought, it has never been the right time. <laughs> I've stepped out on faith in my life so much so that I've had family members that have looked at me, extended family members, and said, I don't know that I'd do that. Well, I can't help it if God puts it on my heart and he says, go do it, and it looks like wind's coming in. I don't know how God's gonna do it other than he'll take that wind and it'll run this way and I'll be okay. Every time I went out of my comfort zone, people checked me. You're coming out of your, they, they should have just said, fear's going to hit you. The fear of failure is going to walk in and talk to you. Uncertainty is going to be everywhere. And just as quick as I would do something, General Motors shut down. 30,000 jobs in Montgomery County and Dayton in general. 30,000 jobs. People all in the church took the buyout and said, we're moving to Tennessee. We're going to Florida. We're going to the hills of Kentucky. We're going to live there happily ever after got their hands on the money, some of them, they never made it to Tennessee. They were paying for people's funerals, buying cars. Next thing you know, got no money. Here we are, just built, just bought land, just bought a building, Emory shut down, which was a massive amount of jobs at the airport. I've been there. I've been through all the recessions that hit when the stock market crashed. 30 plus years I've been pastoring. And every time we would start building something, recession's coming, stock market's crashing, General Motors is shutting down, Emory's leaving. If you sit around and look at everything that's going on around you, you'll never make a move to step out in faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm not backing up, I'm gonna keep on preaching. Hallelujah. Y'all have me concerned. Everybody sitting quietly. That's what Brother Peter did when he was sitting in the boat. And the other disciples were watching him and he was the only one that said, y'all aren't moving? I'm getting out. Because he just told me to come walking on the water. Anything that has to do with a threat of faith will make no sense at all. I said anything that has a threat of faith on it will make no sense. Because anything that takes faith means it's impossible for you to do it by yourself on your own. This is the whole concept of faith that you trust God because you got a word from God and you don't care what it looks like. If you observe the wind, if you watch the wind, you'll never move. Don't you do that. I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't purchase that. Oh, I wouldn't make that step. How are you ever going to know if God is able if you don't ever step out of the boat? Thank you. Tell your neighbor, stop watching the wind. Stop watching the wind. Stop watching what's going on around. Well, I'm going to wait to see who gets in the presidency. Well, you'll be waiting till November. And I'm going to tell you, whoever your favorite candidate, when he gets in or when she gets in or whatever happens, you're still going to be sitting there going, well, now we don't know exactly what they're going to do. Are they going to flip-flop after the fact? Are they going to hold up on the promise? Come on, everybody. It's not about us to begin with. It's about the hierarchy up here. Trying to scratch one another's back and rub one another's feet. Y'all might as well shout amen. But we're this remnant of people that might not be up here, but in God's eyes, we sit together in heavenly places. We've got a God that will not fail us, who gave a son that made this salvation fail-proof. I've come by to tell you he's able and he's worthy. I knew what we were getting into. 
I knew the building process. I knew several years ago we built, the Lord blessed us to build a gymnasium for half the price of what we're building, a building that is half the size of that building right there. What are you supposed to do when things like this hit? What do you do? You just chalk it up and you say, let's build because I heard God say it. God's not moved by the downturn of the economy. God's not moved by gas prices at $2.99. God's not moved by a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk and 12 eggs that cost three to four times more than they did five years ago. I'm not going to get in a boat and start complaining about where we are. I'm not asking God to bring the prices down. I'm asking him to bless me so much they won't even move me. If all you do is sit around and watch the wind, you'll never tithe. You'll never give to the church. You will hold on to that and you will block a lot of blessing that God has for you. I'm telling you, saints of God, I know you're going to snub up on me now. You're going to get quiet and won't shout now. But when you turn loose of it, that's when God gets it in his hand and the blessings start to roll in. Somebody hands me $10, God gets a dollar. And then I give an offering. Somebody gives me 100, God gets 10. And then I give an offering on top of that. Come on, you can't look at everything. Oh God, I need some eggs. Hallelujah. He will send a neighbor 10 miles away, fly a hen to your house and drop you some eggs if he needs to. I just come by to tell you he is the God of all impossibilities. If you sit around waiting to do something and you know you heard from God and you're watching the wind and not seeing the voice of God, you're going to fail every time. Recession. Then COVID hits. COVID hits. We have a massive slab in the back of this property right when COVID hits. I go to Europe. I come home on a plane. And I'm somewhere over crossing about halfway through the pond. And I start shivering and shaking. And I can't get it to stop. So I took some Tylenol and I took some Advil. And by the time I got to Miami, Florida... I'm walking through the airport, and I feel like I'm about to lay down and die. I had to drag myself over to the budget counter to get a car. I drug myself to get to the place where we were going to stay that night, Jill and I. Come on, Jesus. I didn't know what was going on. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? We're in the middle of a, middle of a building project for our, for our teenagers. And then this COVID thing hits. And then... I said, oh wow, our church is down three, four, five hundred people are not here on a Sunday morning. That's a Sunday morning. Oh, talk to me now, Jesus. And I go home, and our offering is down about that much as well. And I said, we're in trouble. And I called the contractors and I said, shut the job down. They said, this is an act of God. And by law, you sign the paperwork, we'll shut the job down. I said, shut it down. Five days goes by, I'm watching everything that's going on, and I hear the Lord whisper to me, I didn't tell you to shut the job down. And that was it. Never explained why he said it to me. Never walked back to me, walked me through the process. Never told me about the repercussions. All he said was, I never told you to shut the job down. That is all God said to me. And by Sunday, I'm praying, and I'm saying to myself, you better not miss God. You've seen recession. You've seen jobs walk away. Cast your bread on the water. Cast your bread on the water. Cast your bread on the water. God, it makes no sense. Cast your bread on the water. It'll come back. Cast your cares on me, for I care for you. And all of a sudden, by Monday, I walked in, and I said, get the job going right now, immediately. 
You know what they did? One phone call was made to the contractor. And you know what we told him? Get the job started. Get the paperwork in here. Get the steel for the building that we need right now. Order it. And we put a deposit on the steel. And do you know that Friday rolled around of the following week that I said started on Monday? And do you know price went up on the steel so fast that if we would not have signed the contract Monday and put a deposit on, it would have cost $250,000 more on the steel. I can't get nobody to help me. I dare you to tell your neighbor you cannot watch the wind hallelujah you cannot come to church when you don't feel like it and not give the Lord some praise now I'm not pushing on you you don't have to clap your hands you don't have to stand up and shout just let me teach to you you cannot come here when you don't feel like it I don't feel like praising God today. And most of that is based on your certain circumstance. Why do you not feel like praising God today? Because you walked in watching the wind. You looked around at everything that was going on and decided today, I'm not into this. Well, first of all, <laughs> you don't get temporary breaks from Christianity. Praise God. You have to get to the place in your life where you walk in here and you are disciplined no matter what this weather looks like, no matter what the wind is doing right now. I come to bless the Lord. This is my time. This is my time to get together with brothers and sisters and lift my hands when I don't feel like it and praise. I'm not telling you to fake it till you make it. I'm not telling you to praise him on credit. I'm telling you at all times, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Sometimes your heart needs to follow the word of God and not the wind. Sometimes your heart needs to follow the spirit and say, I will bless him. I will thank him. I will praise him. I'm going to lift my hands. I'm going to thank him for how good he's been. I know I don't feel like him. I know things aren't going my way. Stop pouting and start shouting. God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all I ask of faith. The Bible says this in 2 Kings 5, 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor. All of these things sound great about Naaman, don't they? The Bible says at the end of that verse in 2 Kings 5 and verse 1, but he was a leper. Wait a minute now. Uh, he's a captain of the host of Syria. He's an incredible fighter. He's a valiant man. He's powerful, but he's a leper. Let's call Naaman to the stage and talk to him. Hey, Naaman. Let me ask you a question, Naaman. How did you do all that? He said, while I was a leper. You hearing what I'm saying? I'm certain with Naaman in his predicament, when he had to fight a battle, he went and took care of business. And he went and fought a battle. When he had to be valiant, he had to be valiant. But the fact is oftentimes, we, we want to sit where we are in our condition and say, I'm, I'm just giving up. I'm just quitting. No, you're not. No, you're not. Now I'm dragging you through the weeds and we're going to hit some briar patches and some thickets. But I'm dragging you through it because the scratches are going to be worth it once I get you on the other side. I'm not going to sit and let you give up and quit because your circumstance isn't conducive to your feelings. I have to get over my feelings. You have to get over your feelings. Sometimes we have to come in 30 years plus a pastorate and every Sunday morning, praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Do you think I hadn't struggled at times? Do you think there are Sunday nights I haven't struggled and Wednesday nights I haven't struggled? But in spite of what you have going on, you cannot watch the wind. You cannot not sow because you think it might rain. You cannot reap because you think there might be a storm. You got to go after it. You got to make it happen and you got to trust God. 
that he's going to be there at every level. Tell your neighbor, don't watch the wind. Naaman was a leper in spite of all of the roses he was given in 2 Kings 5.1. So the fact is, saints of God, don't just fight when you feel like it. There are more days I don't feel like it than I feel like it <laughs> recently. <laughs> Can I say that again? There are more days you don't feel like it than you feel like it. It is consistency of what you do. It is saying every day, that, that every day I'm going to get out of bed and just thank him. Every day I'm going to get, I, I will struggle and thank him. I will go through processes and thank him. I might be wounded and thank him. I might be criticized, but I'm going to thank him. I might be stabbed in the back, but I'm going to thank him. Hallelujah. You don't, know, you, you don't know what it's like to stand up here and preach and somebody hijack a clip of you preaching and put it all over the internet and it starts to go and go and go and critics start chiming in. Secular people, atheists, agnostics start to chime in on you. Oh, Lord, have mercy. People, you can't go to their house. You can't call them on the phone. They got keyboard courage, and they just type out anything they want to but won't say anything to your face. Oh, it can be hurtful at times, and you've got to hang in there. You've got to read anyway. You've got to pray on anyhow. I'm not being dictated by the weather. I'm not every whim of stuff that comes through here. You've got to stand your ground. You've got to fight because the battle sometimes is heavy. Here's a good scripture in 2 Timothy 4 and 2. Preach the word, be instant. In season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Don't walk past something and let the pastor fix it later when you should have rebuked it right then and got it fixed and we'll figure everything else out later. Don't be hateful, be kind, be loving. But I mean, you've got to be instant. Stop walking away from stuff saying, I should have said that. Well, sometimes you shouldn't have. But other times you should have went ahead and said it instead of calling back two months later saying, I'm still frustrated. It's just easier to fix it right on the spot. Some people I'm learning to not say something is saying everything. Because the more God does, the more I run into people that want to pull me down on their level. Hey, preacher. And this have these names for you that you can tell they're just being condescending. Like, like here's a great one. Here comes trouble. I just learned to have selective hearing. I just learned to just keep on walking like, hmm, yeah, I see where the trouble is. And just move on. Be instant in season, out of season. That doesn't always mean instant to praise the Lord. That means instant sometimes to let stuff just roll off of you. Because they really have no right to try to speak to you at all, and they don't even know you. Not like that. Praise God. <laughs> I hope I'm helping some people today. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That means you always have to be ready, saints of God. Man, everybody's so ready to tell everybody off nowadays. How about us all be ready to lift somebody up? Everybody's so anxious to jump in and fix everybody's backyard, and theirs is a mess. Praise God. I want to share something with you, saints of God, that the Lord spoke in my spirit. 
This is what he said to me early this morning when I was working on finishing this. When you stand before God, it's not how much you had. It's how much you gave away. Man, thank you, Jesus, for that. I'm not going to mess with you, saints of God. I'm not going to continue. I'm just going to tell you, when you stand before God, it's not how much you had. It, it is not at all he who dies with the most toys wins. It's not. It's that one that helped everybody else get where God wanted them to be. That will win. I, I say this. One day we will stand before the Lord. And he will not look over the record of assets you have. It will be what you were willing to give away. That's an encouraging word. That's a handshake, a pat on the back. That's I love you and I appreciate you. I thank God for you. All of these things. It can be finances too. You're not taking any of that with you. It's not going where we're going. <clears throat> you're, you're not going to need your $100 bill when we get to streets of gold. Oh, let's praise him right there. Come on. You, le you need to learn to praise God when the inspiration hits and not just after God fixes it. Because we have this mindset to say thank you and to be kind, but with God, he's worked so far in advance for everything he's done for you. You need to thank him for what he's done and what he's doing and what he's going to do. <laughs> because if you've already watched God move, he's still moving and he's not done yet. So just tap your neighbor and say, he's not done yet. <clears throat> Verse number five. As thou knowest, <clears throat> excuse me, as thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. How many times have we watched God move and we to this day still have no clue how he did it? But he did it. Come on. Come on. It's amazing to me that this scripture says the way of the spirit, nor how bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Think about it. You cannot wrap your mind around it. That these beautiful little babies that come into the world and bones grew inside of that precious mama. I don't think enough time, because I think we take everything for granted. We just assume because they show up crying and we turn them over and smack them a little bit and shake them and clean their little nose and mouth out and we love on them and thank you, Lord. There's little bones in that body. There's a little mind going on. What in the world is this? <laughs> and, and they have this desire for milk, and we feed them, and they grow. But look how God has done this. How many times in your life can you look around and say, I don't know how he did it, but he did it. I, 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 sometimes I stop and look around, and I say, God, I don't know how you did it. But I'm thankful, Lord God, that I will give you the praise for everything that you have done. Look at people that are not saved. Trellis, I'm going to ask you to stand up. This brother Trellis, he helps with the offering. He's on a part of the financial board, and I appreciate him. Brother Trellis, you can be seated. I only have, I'm going to ask him to stand up just for a second because I remember many, many years ago when we went out on visitation, a little precious lady named Lily Grubbs came to this church and 
I'm grateful for all the precious saints that have come in and out of these doors, including Brown School Road and the ones before that. And I said to Lily one day, Lily, you have a husband? I do. And I'm telling you, Brother Trellis was a hardcore case. But the Lord put it in my spirit. Go see her husband and talk to him. So I went by and opened up the door. We walked in and we sat down and there he sat in a rocking chair just looking at us. And I said, Trellis, we came to visit you because we are so thankful for your precious wife. She comes to the church and your daughter and family and we've never seen you. I'm not coming to your church. Probably won't ever come to your church. I just kept talking. But Trellis, we'd still love to see you sometime. Still love to see you. Casting the bread right on the water. This, <laughs> sometimes you sit in the chair and go, <laughs> well, God, he just said he ain't ever coming to church. How much longer you want me to stay and talk to him? Just keep casting the bread on the water. <laughs> well, Trellis, we're still going to love you, Trellis. Sure was great meeting you. This is a nice place. I like how it's situated right here on the corner. Just keep throwing bread. Just, God, okay. We love you, Trellis. Thank you for seeing us, even though you're never going to come to church. Thank you, Trellis. But I believe you're going to. I just have this belief. God's going to turn some stuff around. Lily's just clapping her hands. <laughs> Not Trellis. The following Sunday, Trellis comes to church. It don't matter what they say to you. It doesn't matter how low they are. Please don't ever walk by people that you might think, no hope for that one. That's the very one you need to stop and say something good about God to them. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. I'm pushing on you. I'm pulling on you. I'm challenging you. I'm asking you not to be so busy that you don't invest in God's heart, which is to be a witness to people and a light to people and an example to people. I don't always feel like. I'll just say it that way. I get to watch in the wind. I get to watch in what people does, how people react, what people say, what people post how hateful people can be. <clears throat> and I'm the first one to get just as discouraged as anybody else. Think to myself, these are good, godly Christian people acting like this. <laughs> God have mercy. God have mercy. Please, saints of God, invest in the bread. What did Jesus say when he said, I am the bread of life. And what does Solomon say? Cast your bread upon the water. Somebody, please tell somebody about Jesus. That guy at the counter that's stressed out, that's on 50 different medications, that if he would just change his lifestyle drastically, he could probably eliminate a few. He needs Jesus. We're not just trying to, we're not trying to build a church necessarily. We're trying to build the kingdom. Amen. It's not always about come to church, be here. Just build the kingdom. Just build the kingdom. 95% of people that I talk to about the Lord, I don't necessarily ask them to come to church. I just talk to them about Jesus. And then people ask me, what do you do? I'm a pastor. But I want you to know Jesus first. I want you to know Jesus. There's people I've been working on for years. People I'm working on them for years. 
And they keep coming back to me. And I just keep sowing bread on the water. Sowing bread on the water. Woman came to me the other day. I ran into some of your people. I said, what does that mean? It's what she said to me. I ran into some of your people. I go, what does that mean? Well, they had your shirt on. I said, that's not my shirt. That's got a church name on it. Well, I talked to them. And I told them I run into you. I said, did you now? Yeah. They were inviting me to your church. I said, hallelujah. <clears throat> my flesh wanted to say, you need it. <laughs> but my spirit said, that would be awesome. <laughs> I'm just having fun. You cast your bread upon the water. You cast your bread upon the water. The, the, the whole thing. I know, I, know, I know the whole thing makes no sense. Uh, uh, Brother Preacher, well, I'm just going to take good bread and just throw it out in the water because it comes back. It comes back. And when it comes back, it has expanded. It has stretched. And it, 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 is, it is attractive to everything that's, that's in the water. When you take the resources God has given you and you throw them on the water, they will come back to you. Stop hoarding everything that God has given you and start to give back. There's sometimes when I'm minding my own business, God will speak to me and say, I want you to take this and I want you to give it here. And sometimes it doesn't make any sense to me, but I just listen to what the Lord told me. I'm telling you, I've watched him time and time again. Please, stop the stereotyping of those leadership just keep asking for money for blah, 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 blah. You know that old voice. You can hear it rattle on forever. It's the voices of 5,000 people. You've heard that church, that church. Stop it. Stop watching the wind. Stop watching everything running everywhere. And listen to God. Has God not been good to you? And it doesn't matter where you sow it. If God's been good to you, his word is faithful. Praise God, everybody. Hallelujah. Cast your bread. Cast your bread. Cast your bread. Cast your bread. And watch God bless you. Be kind to somebody. Be loving to somebody. Go out of your way. Instead of looking for someone, you can say what you want to say back to them. Look for someone you can be a blessing to them. You can love on them. You can encourage them. God's not about getting ready to do something. He already is. It just depends on who signs up. And, and, and listen, the last I checked, we are the restrainer, the body of Christ, against the Antichrist. When are we going to start restraining? Let me tell you when we're going to start restraining is when we open up our mouth everywhere we go and tell everybody about Jesus. Everywhere we go where we say, praise God, hallelujah, God is good. Not just when you come to church. Do it everywhere you go, run into people and encourage them. I was coming out of a restaurant a couple, a while ago. I was coming out and I seen some people I knew. And then I seen some other people that I knew and I was just encouraging them and loving on them. And I run into a guy getting ready to go out the door that's got his little baby in his arms. And I ran into him and I grabbed him and I pulled him in. And I said, you are loved. You be encouraged. Don't get caught up with the mess of everything that's going on around you. In other words, you know what I told him? Don't watch the wind. Don't watch the wind. Don't let everything going in the world move you. Don't watch it. You do what God told you to do, and God will bless you at every turn that you find a place where God wants to use you. Don't watch the wind. Let's stand together all over the church. I'm not going to be moved by what I see. I'm not going to be moved by what I feel. I'm going to do what God called me to do. Praise God. There's going to be ministry moments when it gets quiet in here. And I've learned to get very comfortable in the quiet times. I've learned after all of these years... God, I said what you wanted me to say. I did what you wanted me to do. 
I know there's thousands of people that would have said it or done it differently. But God, I'm going to do what you told me to do. And I'm going to keep on keeping on. Hallelujah. Turn around and tell somebody, don't watch the wind. Don't watch the wind. Don't watch the wind. With every head bowed and every eye closed in this church, the power of his great name rests upon our hearts and lives. The peace that surpasses all understanding is the peace that Jesus has given us, the hope and the joy. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you've watched the wind, you've watched everybody else, all the critics, everybody that wants to condemn, everybody that wants to put everybody down that's trying to do good, that devil is a liar. Is there anybody that would raise your hand and say, Pastor, I need Jesus. I'm not saved, I need Jesus. Anybody at all, raise that hand and by that say, I know I need the Lord in my life. I know I need Jesus in my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Way in the back, thank you, God. Are there others? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on right now. Come on, come on, sir. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for this young man that's coming to be saved. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Are there others? Are there others? Are there others? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, young man. Come on, come on. Come on. I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. Wait. Wait. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Come on. Come on. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Come on, isn't God good? Come on, isn't God good? Are there others? Are there others? This is it. Are there others? Come on. Come on, God's speaking to you. God's moving in the house. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're going to pray. We're going to pray with these precious souls that are eager to call on Jesus. Let's pray with them. Let's pray together. Father, forgive me and wash me. Come into my heart. Save me from all my sin and unrighteousness. Right now, I accept you as Savior of my life. And I receive you in the mighty name of Jesus. Come into my heart and dwell and stay in Jesus' name. And let the saints of God say amen and amen in the house. Can we rejoice over these precious people today that have received Jesus into their life? Come on, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Father, I lift my hands. And I pray, God, for people right now, people that have heard your voice, people that are hearing your voice, people, God, that need to take their focal point off of the wind or the rain or the storms or the potential for it. Father God, for all of these that are here, that God need to go ahead and move by your presence and cast bread on the water. And it means a multitude of things. And I pray, God, they will live that way. They will do that, Father God. They will be known by their fruits. So, Father, bless and strengthen and encourage. Bless and strengthen and encourage our church and church body. And, Father, we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name. And let the saints of God say amen and amen. Can we rejoice for all of these that have come to make a decision for the Lord?